Good morning, everybody. Or if you're our US guest joining us, good evening. Or if you're watching this some other time on social media, I don't know what time it is, so I'll just say good day. Uh, welcome to HKU Journalism's uh, Zoom webinar series. Um, this topic today is on visual journalism. It's called Targets of Dissent, the Rights, Threats, and Consequences of Documenting Dissent. I'm Keith Richburg. I'm the director of HKU Journalism, formerly known as the Journalism and Media Studies Center. And uh, I just want to remind everybody that we are recording this session. It will be available later uh, via our YouTube channel. Um, you know, this is a really important topic. And I think it's really interesting that we are doing it today, which would be the, uh, the day of the, uh, the Derek Chauvin trial starting in Minneapolis, where we once again um, had to watch that very gruesome video during the prosecutor's opening statements. And, you know, and, and if, if we may have forgotten already, because so much has happened in the last uh, months, but you know the, the the death of George Floyd uh, in Minneapolis set off this uh, global, real glo really global protest movement around the world for equity and justice. Um, but at the, you know at this time when we see these protest movements and 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 other things going on around the world, the media, which used to be seen as the neutral observer, have suddenly become targets of distrust, and by both sides, by the authorities, but also by protesters. And that's much of what we want to talk about today is why is that that the media now seems to be as much a target? What can be done to stop this? What obligations uh, do members of the press and particularly visual journalists uh, have and how they can protect themselves um, in, in this new rising atmosphere of distrust? And we've got a really esteemed panel. I'm really glad that I was able to keep everybody awake and then get one up at night to, to, in the middle of the night to come and join us. In alphabetical order, uh, we've got Laurel Chor. Uh, she is an Emmy-nominated uh, journalist and photographer and filmmaker right here from Hong Kong. She covered the Hong Kong protests. Uh, if you weren't following her on Twitter, then you were doing it all wrong. And I'm told she's on some, a new assignment now in the Seychelles, which I'm sure she'll tell us all about. Uh, we have Tara Pixley, um, PhD, a photographer and a professor with a 20-year career in visual journalism. And she is based in Los Angeles, where she teaches journalism and media studies at Loyola Marymount University. And, uh, and she was also a visiting Knight Fellow at uh, Harvard's Neiman Foundation. And then we have Courtney uh, Ratch. Uh, she is the advocacy director at the Committee to Protect Journalists, uh, spokesperson on global press freedom issues for the organization. And she oversees CPJ's engagement with the United Nations. And, uh, well, and she does a lot of other things as well because her bio is so long, I can't read it all here. <laughs> She'll tell you all the things she's doing, but. It, Protecting press freedom around the world for journalists is a growth industry these days. And then last but not least, we have Achille Ramses. I really hope I pronounced that correctly, Achille. <laughs> and she is the direct executive director of the National Press Photographers Association, which is based at the University of Georgia, uh, Grady College of Journalism and Mass Communication, a Pulitzer Prize winning picture editor and former director of photography, uh, photography for the Orlando Sentinel. And she's back in Atlanta. A lot of things have happened in Atlanta as well. So you'll be able to give us some real firsthand information. So not only do we have a geographical spread here, but we've got a lot of expertise. But uh, Courtney, can I just start with you to help frame this really from a global perspective, because you deal with uh, uh, press freedom on an international level. Uh, first of all, is our is our construct correct that there is rising distrust uh, uh, against journalists and particularly against visual journalists who are out there help trying to document some of these things going on? And if that's true, why is it? So I think if you think about the level of attacks on journalists around the world and you take as a proxy for trust um, the idea that journalists are attacked in retaliation for doing their jobs both by the public as well as by um, those in power. When you look at the number of journalists killed around the world, which is more than 70 last year, the majority of them murdered. If you look at the number of journalists imprisoned, more than 250 each year for the past five years, which are record highs um, since we began keeping records. If you look at the rise in violence against journalists during protests around elections, the endemic harassment that journalists face online, especially women journalists or journalists who occupy minority identities in whatever fora they're working in. Um, it is a very, very challenging time to do journalism. And there seems to be a concerted effort by many to undermine 
the concept of trust, the concept of journalism, of fact-based reporting um, through disinformation campaigns, as I mentioned, you know, mass online harassment, coordinated state-sponsored campaigns, as well as non-state campaigns. And if we go, you know, as you said, in the United States uh, today is the trial that should be starting um, for the man who helped start Black Lives Matter response to this police violence. And we saw in the United States that there were more than 900 violations that um, we're tracking as part of the US press freedom tracker, which we helped found back when Trump took over the presidency. Um, and that is astounding. I mean, we always, it, it's always dangerous for journalists to cover protests, you know, protests, people are out there protesting, right? So we know it's a combustible time. But I think what we've seen over the past several years with the shifts in technology and obviously everyone having a mobile phone in their hands, um, with everyone wanting to control the narrative, whether you're in power, whether you're the protesters, um, journalists no longer occupy that privileged position of being there to tell the story. Um, they are telling a story, but in many cases, protesters wanna tell their own story. The police wanna tell their story or they don't want the story told at all. And we see journalists are getting caught in the middle. Um, we see this in terms of them getting rounded up at protests getting targeted here in the United States. We saw that many law enforcement officers targeted journalists um, for arrest or uh, for violence, despite the fact that they were clearly identified as journalists um, during Black Lives Matter protests. So, and that is not unique to the United States. Unfortunately, that is something that we are all too, you know, used to seeing in places like Egypt, where I worked as a journalist, or in Lebanon, uh, or in Russia, or, you know, a, a many other places. Um, unfortunately, you know, the, I think the situation for visual journalists who are required to be on the ground and documenting it, it's not a desk job, um, has really gotten more precarious. And when you wrap that, wrap this all up in COVID, you know, it's a very challenging time because you've also got to take extreme safety precautions uh, because you're going to be out there documenting uh, people on the ground, you know, getting out to get that close up. And so you've got to think about multiple different safety uh, issues when you're out there reporting. So, you know, in a nutshell, it's a very challenging time to be a journalist, especially a visual journalist. And it seems like trust in the media is at an all time low, although maybe with COVID it's rising a little bit as people understand the difference between journalism and opinion. And Courtney, before I let you go to the um, you know, President Trump is now gone, but this phrase he threw around every day, fake news and journalists are the enemy of the people. Is that something that's living beyond him, him being in the White House? <laughs> Yes, we saw and we documented over the past four years, the expansion of not just the rhetoric around the media as fake news and enemies of the people, but the translation of that into public policy and into the rise in the number of journalists imprisoned on false news statutes. So when Trump took office, and let me be clear, this is not Trump's fault, right? I mean, China, Russia, Egypt, Turkey, were all imprisoning journalists long before Trump was in office, and I'm sure, sadly, will continue long after he's in office. But what the President of the United States constantly using the refrain of fake news and enemies of the people did was to provide cover for that repress repression and to provide a pathway for other um, democratators, as our executive director calls them, or you know, other populist uh, leaders with authoritarian tendencies to lob onto that rhetoric. The fake news rhetoric has become a very common refrain around the world and democratic and authoritarian countries alike to denigrate and dismiss the news, to undermine their ability to report on those in power and hold them accountable. And we have seen that in the number of journalists imprisoned on false news charges. Um, I think it was about, it was a, just a handful in 2012. Um, last year, there were dozens of journalists imprisoned on false news charges. And we're seeing the proliferation of false news statutes which again have been given uh, greater impetus by COVID-19 when there is a very real public health concern. But again, we're seeing countries that would love no more than having an excuse to clamp down on independent reporting using that 
false news as an excuse. And then, of course, we continue to see that journalists being labeled as enemies of the people has been welcomed by countries like China, like Russia, uh, like Egypt, which routinely imprison journalists on terrorism charges and equate journalism with terrorism or sedition. Um, and, and this has created a very challenging and, and terrible situation for journalists, which is not going to be undone simply since you know, he's left office. He created an entire you know, modus operandi and, and also of course the way that he used social media to um, propagate those attacks, which many other um, countries are doing the same. You know, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Duterte in the Philippines, um, Poland and Hungary, you know, it's really, we're seeing the deterioration um, of global journalism around the world, but we're seeing some amazing reporters and journalists out there doing their jobs nonetheless. And I really do think we are at a time right now when we see and the world sees the importance of journalists, that we want journalists reporting from Wuhan in China because we don't trust the authorities. Um, we want to see journalists reporting on what's happening in Hong Kong, what's happening in Belarus, what's happening in Atlanta or Baltimore or here in Washington, DC. You know, I live in Washington, DC. I want to watch what the news um, media is reporting, not what you know our local authorities are reporting. So I think there is this tension now between this years-long decline uh, of trust in journalism at the same time that a lot of different events are coming together and, and making people question about maybe they should give journalists a little bit more credit. Well, thank you for that. I'm going to move on. I'll get back to you because there's some interesting points you made I want to get back to. And by the way, I'll remind the audience as well that uh, there'll be some time for questions at the end of this from the audience. So if you do have questions, put them in the chat box. We'll, we'll I'll filter them out through our moderator, Jennifer Wang, and read them to the panelists. Don't have to worry about looking at the questions, but do put them in the chat box if you have questions for us and we'll save some minutes at the end. But uh, uh, keying off what you said, Akili, can I go to you for a moment? You're in Atlanta. Uh, explain something to me, because I was watching CNN from here in Hong Kong, and I, during the Black Lives Matter protests, I think there was a police shooting uh, in Atlanta, correct me if I'm wrong, and there was an attack on CNN headquarters. And I didn't understand that because I said, well, wait a minute, CNN is out there trying to document your movement and trying to show people what happened around the world, people like me in Hong Kong. Why would you attack CNN? Aren't they, <laughs> aren't they kind of neutral in this or at least trying to show the world what's going on? Can you explain that? Put us in that situation and tell me what's, what, what, what was going on then? <laughs> I think it really, um, Courtney kind of gave the backdrop to why people are in this conflicted opinion about what journalists, what our job is, what we're there to do, to document the story. So you have on one hand, you have people on uh, demonizing journalists, and there's a lack of trust that has eroded over the years, as Courtney also alluded, this didn't start with Trump, this is starting as far back as even as uh, Richard Nixon and um, uh, Spiro Agnew, tricky, you know, it's so it's not a new thing. I think the newest thing is 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 people not seeing journalists really as a neutral observer telling their stories. And because there's also been so much um, about distrust of journalists using their position to um, upend organizations fighting for struggle. So they find us complicit on one hand to uh, inform the authorities. On the other hand, they're out wanting to get the attention for the causes they're, they're protesting for. So we're kind of caught in this crossfire right here. Um, and I, I, I don't think it's an accident, honestly. I think it's just been a constant erosion of uh, what it is we do, what the purpose we stand for. And, and we've had some black, bad players who've helped that along the way within and without outside the industry. So, um, and it's kind of a complicated thing in the sense that not all uh, people who call themselves journalists these days actually have studied, know ethics, know how to, if you're out there telling a the story, you just wanna be a part of the mix. So all, and everybody with a camera these days can call themselves a journalist. So there's that essentially. And it's not just here in Atlanta. It's been almost uh, one of the things our organization has dealt with 
our uh, our legal counsel, Mickey Osterreicher and Alicia Calzada, has been spending a lot of time working, doing workshops and educational seminars and on law enforcement and journalism and, and having to go to rescue photographers. We bail them out of jail. We find representations. We've had to, we've partnered with uh, several different organizations to provide legal counsel for uh, journalists. And uh, like, for instance, we've partnered with the um, uh, Press Freedom Defense Fund to be able to, to have uh, pro bono work for lawyers, uh, for, for uh, photographers who are out there. And, and like writers, we can't be, we're very visible. You're carrying all this gear around and so it's it, you're you're an easy target, basically. Are the, do you believe the these journalists carrying all this gear and the camera equipment are they it more in danger from law enforcement who don't want that narrative shown, or do are they more in danger from protesters who who see them as part of the establishment, or is it equal? It's situational. <laughs> Let me put it like that. It is very situational. We've been actually providing seminars to f photographers how to protect you how to protect yourself, what to look at, and strongly advising people not to work by themselves anymore. Um, long before the protest started, particularly in the Bay Area, I worked in, just as I was leaving San Jose, uh, for the last decade, attacks on photographers has been extreme. I mean, they've been targets where photographers were getting beat up and gear stolen um, quite frequently in the Bay Area. So uh, a lot, particularly in broadcasts have to gone back to, uh, they had gone down to, you know, like we call a one person uh, backpack journalist, but they were so endangered, they're now teaming them back up again, just so people can have their bags and somehow going as far as hiring security for their uh, journalists on the scene. Amazing that has to happen in the United States. I used to get kind of hostile environment training before going to Afghanistan and Iraq. <laughs> Uh, let's, Tara, you're on the, the opposite coast. Can we move from uh, East Coast to West Coast? And uh, if I may say, maybe you guys at the West Coast were the uh, originators of visual journalism, because I seem to recall the Rodney King <laughs> episode was shot by a, a, some guy who just was testing out a new camcorder or something and happened to film the Rodney King episode. And uh, even then, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, he got some threats or uh, afterwards for releasing that video, which which went around the world. But uh, what, what's the situation like there now in terms of what we've been talking about here? Journalists, visual journalists, especially, you know, being being themselves targeted or targets of distrust. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to kind of. Um co-sign some of the things that Akili has has brought out and say that I believe we would be remiss to not acknowledge that there are long-standing issues where mainstream news media has often either ignored or misrepresented, underrepresented the lives and stories of marginalized groups. And that long simmering frustration between the publics that often feel um, unheard, not that they don't have a voice, but they aren't being listened to. And, and now there's a space of social media that allows those voices to be centered, to, to rise above or to become part of the conversation. And I think we journalists, professional journalists are being caught in this kind of difficult space where we're being held to account by our publics as we try to hold power to account as well. And we're having to sort of reimagine these roles. And it's interesting that you bring up the, the Rodney King, um, what happened with Rodney King. And you know, that uh, predates me being in the West Coast, but certainly those are deeply held scars and old pains that have not gone away. And the sense, I, I certainly would not pretend to uh, speak for all of Los Angeles, but my personal experiences when participating in and photographing, uh, being at the site and scene of racial justice protests was to see that people are scared. They're afraid of, um, they're afraid of what police might do, but they're afraid of what police will do if they don't speak up and come out and sh show out and show up together. And I think journalists are also afraid. I was very fearful actually attending some of the protests that I went to. And then I felt honestly that I didn't need to be fearful as time went on. I did feel as though uh, my perception of what I needed to fear from the protesters themselves was perhaps um, 
overstated by some of the things I was seeing publicized and published in the news media that I, I consume. And I think that it's difficult to sort of parse out um, where those lines are. Certainly looting and, and violence and fires and things like that are happening. There are violence, um, or there's violence rather on the coming from police and also coming from other people who may or may not be protesters or who, but are part of the public. And journalists are trying to kind of hold some space there to tell that story as accurately and honestly as possible. And it can be incredibly difficult when you're being essentially, um, you know, potentially aggressed from either side. Mm -hmm. And there's so many different forces that are um, kind of in play in that you have people who are appearing to be protesters or using the protests as a cover to attack media for their various reasons. And you have people who are protesters who are very upset about being photographed, misrepresented, or uh, carelessly treated by some journalists. I think Akili spoke to this that, you know, unfortunately not all of our colleagues adhere to the kind of ethics in their approach to the, the engaging with the public that we might like or we might hope for. And you know, that's another thing that I really want to speak to is the importance of our individual responsibility as journalists to comport ourselves in a way in relationship to the public that we're showing all the time that we actually are in service to the public, that we're trying to um, represent the work that we're doing and be honest about who we are, what we're doing there, what, why we're taking images. If we're having those conversations, that certainly isn't going to stop every person who is just you know, determined to despise journalists or to be suspicious of journalists but it will make inroads with people who are uncertain. So there, I've met so many wonderful people working as a photojournalist and you know, in many different spaces and also at protests where they have been burned by other journalists by the way that they were treated or they have a perception of journalists but they've never met any. And so every opportunity that I speak to someone, that I lift my camera, that I am engaging in a public space and all, that is an opportunity for me to actually show people what a journal, an ethical journalist is and does, that I am there for them and not for, you know, I'm there to hold power accountable just as they are hoping to do. And so we're really working as colleagues and collaborators in, you know, a, a just world. So that was the experience that I had is that I, I never personally felt aggressed. Um, I did, as I said, I originally was a little concerned and I was worried, especially about being so visible with my camera, but frankly, there were hundreds of people with cameras and it, I felt like maybe I just kind of blended into that, that space of so many cameras. And I personally never saw, I went to many, many different protests here in Los Angeles and I never actually saw anyone with a camera being aggressed. Uh, I did see people with cameras being aggressive. <laughs> and, you know, again, I think it's a, a multifaceted issue that we can, we will continue to unpack and try to understand in order to to get to you know kind of a better future i might hope for photojournalism sure but uh, just to follow up to you and again i'm going to steal one of the questions from an audience member because it kind of fits in with what you were saying about your own experience it comes from gina marchetti who's a comparative literature professor here at uh, hku university of hong kong she's asking the question and again i might ask all of the panelists later on but uh, just for you right now tara she's saying could you comment on an instance when being a woman may have either helped or hindered you in some of these circumstances where you, where things are a bit dicey. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's hard to say how much people are, you know, without me going around and saying, hi, do you feel more comfortable with me because I'm a woman, <laughs> which I haven't tried that tact yet. Mm -hmm. But I do think that I have been given more of the benefit of, of doubt um, when approaching people in a in public space and uh, especially photographing protests or, um, even beyond the protest space, I photograph in I photograph strangers and walk up to people in public all the time for my job as a photojournalist. And I have very rarely been met with anything but kind of openness and kindness. And so I think uh, if I'm being honest, that probably has something to do with me being you know femme embodied and appearing um, to be feminine or, or female in this way. I would say that the times that I felt, that being a woman photojournalist was perhaps less beneficial was actually, um, I've spoken about this a few times in different talks and things, but I was actually pushed multiple times, pushed out of the way by my fellow male colleagues in, in uh, visual journalism in, or 
people with cameras. So I can't confirm absolutely that all of them were professional journalists, at least a few of them were. But that's an experience that I've had many times throughout my career. The times that I feel the most um, actually dismissed or, or undervalued is in those spaces with other male um, or with male colleagues in my actual field. So that's unfortunate, but I do think that being a woman photographer has made people feel perhaps a little bit more willing to speak to me on some occasions. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, this is a really good time to turn to Laurel because uh, Laurel, you were you were out there on the front lines of the Hong Kong protest. I mean, you were you, know, you were tweeting away and you had a front row seat going on, but correct me if I'm wrong, but you were one of the few female photographers, right? It's a pretty male profession out in here in Hong Kong, but tell us a little bit about your experiences. Tell us about, you know, the distrust that you may have seen from both sides, from the police and from the protesters. And then also please do address that question about what was it like being a woman photographer out there? Yeah, um, I'll go ahead and address that one first. Um, I think, you know, a being a photojournalist is a very embodied experience, right? Like you're there in the field, people see you, they interact with you, they have perceptions of you. And for the same reasons that people might be more willing to talk or find me less uh, scary or the same reasons why I might be more vulnerable, right? I'm perceived as less dangerous, as, as, um, as more vulnerable, as maybe easier to push around and in some circumstances, that means people might be more willing to help me or to look out for me or to speak to me. But on the other hand, it also means people might think it's easier to push me around or, or you know, not take me seriously. And in the Hong Kong context specifically, where it was such a big international story and there were photographers coming from all over the world, you know, for me as a young local woman, I was definitely, you know, I've you know, I've always made sure, at least at the beginning, to always wear my vest, to always have my ID, my badge visible. Those were things I knew I had to do to, to mark myself as a photojournalist. Whereas, frankly, you know, white guys could walk around with a camera without really identifying themselves and the police more or less let them do what they wanted. So those were considerations that I had to take. Um, in terms of, of the distrust towards journalists, it, it's certain, you know, at the beginning of the protest, I felt like the movement itself was sort of figuring out how to deal with the media. I think at the beginning, there was distrust. There was also this fear of being photographed in general, um, out of fear of being identified by authorities later. And I remember specifically on July 1st, protesters were being actually quite aggressive towards you know, the, so this was about a month or two into the protests and protesters were being quite aggressive towards anyone filming them because they felt like they had to protect themselves. And July 1st, when they were breaking into the legislature, you know, protesters were following me around with umbrellas trying to block me from photographing and, and you know, to the point of actually like kind of pushing me back and, and pointing me out and telling people to follow me. And afterwards, on uh, the Golden, the Hong Kong Forum where protesters talk, there was actually discussions of, hey, how should we deal with the media? Let's put lines down. It's not okay to push journalists. It's not okay to be aggressive towards journalists. We kind of, and from then on, I did sense a difference where they realized that they had to let the media do their job. And I think that, from what I've seen from afar is kind of different from what was happening in the States with BLM where I think there were a lot more heated debates about the role of journalists and, and what role visual journalists should do in protecting the people they're photographing. Whereas in Hong Kong, there seemed to be this understanding that from the protesters that they had to let journalists do their job. They had to leave them alone and the onus was on them to hide their identities, to protect, um, to protect their own safety in a public arena where where they're going to be photographed and they also there was also this savviness in the hong kong protests where people were very you know it went from this distrust to being very aware that they're being photographed i felt you know it's which was interesting as a photojournalist to be photographing a movement where they're very visually literate very 
media savvy, very aware of what's visual, very aware of, of, of what has viral potential, if you will. Um, and dealing with the police and, and the government in Hong Kong, that became a challenge too. I mean, Courtney mentioned how journalists now are just putting forth one story now. And you're seeing that so literally in Hong Kong where now the Hong Kong police are, are putting out their own content. They're having their own live streams. They are so, they are literally putting forth their own narrative and trying to provide an alternative. Uh, and you know, you've, you've seen the way their social media account is also being handled now. You know, they're using hashtags, making videos, or they're profiling specific police officers. They're making, you know, content that's very much in the tone they try to be of the the tone of the internet culture these days. So, I mean, I think, yeah, journalists are definitely put in a, an increasingly difficult position, and especially when there's outright attacks on journalists, especially from the government, the journalists in Hong Kong have been forced to speak up. And I think to the public, when they perceive that, when they perceive journalists being forced to say, this is wrong, this is not okay, you have to let us do your job, they kind of see that as us going against the government. and. And that in itself becomes a factor in how how we're perceived. So it's it's certainly been been tough. Um, I think there's an all time high of distrust of journalists in Hong Kong. I think it has to do with increasing polarization in Hong Kong, with everyone suddenly feeling like there's two sides to the story. Or so it's it's been tough. But on the other hand, I think there's been an increased appreciation for journalists too. I think through the protests, a certain subset of the Hong Kong population have realized the importance of journalists and what journalists have to go through in order to get the story out. And that sort of appreciation is not what you usually get as a journalist. Um, so that that's one silver lining. But Laurel, if I'm not mistaken, from reading your Twitter feed during the protests, I think you were you've had tear gas shot at you. You've been you've been in areas where rubber bullets were being fired. You've been uh, pepper sprayed, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, tell us a little bit more about the danger that you were in. And did you ever feel like your your, your life was being threatened? Yeah, there are certainly a lot of things you had to deal with, tear gas um, became an issue. I mean, there's one live streamer from, I think, Stan News, who actually ended up hospitalized for chronic exposure to tear gas. Um, you know, tear gas, rubber bullets, pepper spray was an annoying one because it meant that, you know, it was usually within arm's distance of an officer. Uh, Water cannons were a big one. So it, it was something you always had to be aware of and, and, and prepare for, and I think did become increasingly difficult when there were, frankly, in instances when the police were targeting us. Um, you know, there was one instance when I was tear gassed, and I say I because it really felt like they were tear gassing me personally because I was on an empty street with maybe five colleagues and there were no protesters. and the only warning we got that tear gas was about to, to happen was because we saw the police officers we were standing feet away from suddenly put on their masks and we scrambled to put on our masks. And, and then tear gas is an empty street where there's just us. Um, and then they surrounded us with, with riot shield and, and pushed us into a circle. And that's the only time that's happened to me, but that was a very clear targeting of us. Um, and there have been instances when they've thrown tear gas into crowds of, of, of journalists, things like that. So yeah, it's, it's something you have to deal with. It's something you have to prepare for. Um, you know, I've been hit with water cannon in the back of my neck and the water cannons here uh, in Hong Kong are often laced with pepper spray, so it's extremely painful. Um, but in terms of, of fearing for myself, I think instances, I mean, I had, it's when you're caught in the middle and, or, or when, I mean, at Ed Polytechnic University, when there was a siege there, that was, there were definitely a few dicey situations with fire and, and, and being trapped inside. But all in all, I think I, I felt lucky and, and protected. Probably the instances where I felt the most 
um, in danger is when the police, you know, the few times they use live ammunition, uh, particularly because it, it was used by officers who were clearly not well trained and who were scared and you don't want to be around anyone who's scared for their life with the gun in hand and those were that's when I started wearing flak as well so a lot a lot of challenges to deal with for sure. Sounds like covering a war zone uh, Courtney Courtney what what's when you look around the world which is your kind of purview I'm looking around just on our neighborhood here and I see protest in Myanmar and I see journalists being being arrested. Some have been released. I'm looking in Bangkok and across Thailand. There are protests against the military government. It's a protest everywhere. What, what's the biggest danger that you see for journalists? I know the numbers killed have been very large, unfortunately, over the last year. But is it the actual you know danger in these protests, or is it uh, persecution of journalists under these new so-called fake news laws? Is it in some places I'm now seeing defamation laws? Uh, being used to hamper journalists. I mean, what do you, or is it all of these things? I mean, what's the, what do you what do you deal with most on your in in your inbox? Um, yeah, I mean, it really is all of those things because also they feed on each other, right? So when you see that American law enforcement are attacking journalists and getting away with it, that sends a signal around the world, like, hey, we should try this. You know, we saw in Nigeria, for example. Um, similar police violence uh, against protesters there who were, I think, protesting against some, you know, similar issues. And I think, you know, somebody mentioned earlier, like situational awareness and, and context matters. I mean, I think you really like that, that really is the thing. And one of one of the things that we really advocate for, especially through our emergencies department is doing a risk assessment, because it depends. Like if you're a visual journalist going out to cover a protest, you want to do your risk assessment. Think about how your identity plays into that. What kind of equipment do you need to use? Is your, you know, are your main threats coming from protesters, police, you know, fight if you're covering a fire, you know, you, you need to be prepared. Or if you're going to cover, you know, like, you know, I, I, I used to work in Dubai and went to go cover like a, a labor camp, right? There I'm not worried about protests, but I'm worried about say getting, you know, picked up by police. Um, so you always want to understand what the risks are that have to do with the assignment that you're working on or the story that you're covering. Um, because the risks are so multifaceted right now. I mean, you hit the nail on the head, which is you see what seems like rising violence against journalists. Um, and, and, and you see the, the environment in which they're operating just becoming so much more challenging because you've got all these restrictive laws. You've got all of these kind of co coronavirus restrictions on movement. I mean, and, and you know, a, a year ago, we saw a lot of journalists getting arrested because they were either breaking quarantine or thought to be breaking quarantine because whoever was enforcing the law didn't know that journalists were exempt or not. Um, you know, so it, it really varies, I think, on context. And then again, this, the online harassment is not only about like the targeting of the journalists themselves, but then you, you go on social media and you see all of this vitriol and hatred towards journalists that also sends a signal and creates a context. You know, you met, we mentioned, we were talking earlier about, you know, distrust in the media here in the United States, you know, there are people who have never met a journalist. You know, the, the decline in local news in the United States, I think has something to do with the fact that, you know, the media is seen as those, you know, elitists out on the coasts covering national issues. And there's this disengagement from the local. Um, and, and also, you know, there is this idea that, oh, anyone with a camera can be a journalist. But I think that we do ourselves a disservice by equating observation with journalism. Um, you know, when, so I, I uh, did my doctoral studies and wrote my book about the cyber activists and citizen journalists in Egypt who were using social media in the lead up to 2010 to document and hold police accountable for human rights abuses there. But they were doing it in an intentional way to do journalism using these alternative means. It's not the same thing to say that just because you capture something on video that you're doing journalism. You know, the person, I remember when some guy tweeted about seeing the drone strike that killed Osama bin Laden. And then everyone was like, oh, citizen journalism. 
that's not citizen journalism. That's a source. Like that's an observation. And then that becomes a source. And I don't, I mean, my, actually the first thing I ever published in the LA times was about the Rodney King um, anniversary. Cause I went to high school in Los Angeles and you know, I don't know whether the, the guy who took the video was doing journalism as much as he was just observing it. But I think that we as journalists need to think about what is it that journalism adds? What makes something journalism versus, you know, just documentation, poetry, propaganda, right? There has to be this facticity, accuracy, you know, some aspect of like balance and truthfulness. And of course, we're always going to have, you know, discussions about that. But you know, I, I do think this, I, this, this conversation that, you know, well, what is journalism? We can't tell the difference. It's actually, you know, being in Washington, D.C. Um, during the Black Lives Matter protests and then also during uh, the, the, you know, anti-election um, protests, you could tell who was there doing journalism. Like, it actually was not that hard. There were not a lot of, you know, there were certainly some, like, random people with cameras who were there with an agenda, but there were also very clearly identifiable journalists. So I think we should also be careful as journalists to make sure that people understand the value that journalism brings, that that doing something with the intention of doing journalism. And that's actually what the Committee to Protect Journalists, we don't define who is a journalist or not. You don't have to have a credential, you don't have to have studied journalism, but you do have to be doing acts of journalism and engaged in journalism versus, you know, social media activism, which is a very fine and entirely subjective line, but it is it is a judgment call worth making. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me bring in uh, some of the other journalists here and the photographers. Achille, let me ask you this question. What, what, um, what responsibility or ethical obligations does a journalist, and especially a visual journalist have if they're in Atlanta and they're taking a picture or shooting a video of someone throwing a Molotov cocktail at a police car and that person's face is clearly visible. Do they need to get that person's consent? Should they try to black out the face or what do you, how do, how do we deal with this? <laughs> um, well, <laughs> what do you tell people? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, NPPA, we actually have, have an established code of ethics that the majority of news organizations actually use as a, as a, uh, baseline and uh, I put into the chat there but we're documenting news uh if someone doesn't make that choice to engage in that activity um I've been on both sides of it I've actually been uh I was in LA covering the LA uh Rodney King uh trials and the the, uh, the riots that followed uh the rises that followed afterwards and I'm in situations where I'm uh, as both an editor and a photographer because I lived in South Central Los Angeles. So I'm observing people looting and actual, and one of the pictures that still of mine that still runs around on the wires is on the anniversary is also one of a group of people running through uh, a Payless shoe store. You know, this is, and, if you're going to loot, why would you loot Payless shoes? I mean. <laughs> right. But I honestly think that I, you know, you don't intentionally try to put someone in, in a place of trouble, but people make choices. And we're in a public, um, if you're in a public spot, and whether it's protesting or doing something illegal, I don't think it's my job to inform on you. But at the same time, and we don't uh, release our unpublished materials to law enforcement. We figure we can't don't do their job for them. If it was published, it's there. But I think more than anything, you want to be, you know, do no harm. And you want to be able to show, uh, cover a, a complete story and not just the flamboyant and the most, you know, uh, attention grabbing aspect. We, as journalists, I think it's our responsibility to tell the whole story. And, and it's not just of people destroying mad and whatever, but also letting people know we're telling your story. We're here, we protect you as much as we tell your story. We're not trying to cover anything up or aid or anything. We're documenting uh, moments of history right now. And I, uh, we've also done studies that shows the general public actually can determine and appreciate differences between professionally shot 
story, a, a, a true photojournalist versus an amateur who just happened to capture a particular moment in time. And um, I think it's up to us to uh, make sure there's, there's opportunities to get consent and there's opportunities it's impossible and you have to make a determination uh, what to do with the image. I, I always say, both as an editor, take the shot, let us make the decision once we come back and decide, is this worthy and tells a complete story or is it a piece of a story? And so there's a lot of, and, and I tell you, um, on the editing side, there is a lot of discussion and events like this that go into choosing what goes into the news, into online these days, uh, print still, but it's not, these are easy questions to answer. Uh, but if there is kind of like implied consent, when you try to get people's attention, uh, basically if you're able to identify someone and be able to reach them, get their name, just say, hey, I photographed you at this event. Can I get your name? And that is implied consent right there. Uh, if people have actually stated they don't want to be, they want their names out there, they don't want to be identified, that's their choice. And so I will use a photo, photo of someone who has um, told me specifically they don't want to their photograph used. Mm -hmm. But if, sometimes if it's in the public, it's, if it's sometimes the news itself determines how important it is to take an image and whether to use an image. And it's, um, it's a balancing act. And again, it goes back to situational. I think it's for me, it's always been the best, doing the best you can to tell the full and complete story. One of the things I noticed, like again, going back to the LA uh, uprising after the Rodney King situation, uh, it was being both black and female that gave me a lot more latitude in certain situations because after photographing that particular scene and so much is going around you so quickly, you're not sometimes even aware of everything you're shooting. And at one moment, this big guy came up there. It's like in my face, said, did you take my picture? Did you take my picture? And I had to say, tell him, I said, honestly, I don't know if I did or not. <laughs> you may have been in the frame. You may not have been. I says, but I told him who I was. I says, if I see you in this, I, I will not use that image. <laughs> and, and, but I also before, um, I was working for Associated Press at the time, but I had been in the community for so long. I worked with the black press. I was a, a, a regular figure around the community and his girlfriend actually pulled him off and just said, hey, you know, that's the sister who she, she, she shoot around her all the time. Don't bother her, let her do her job and you just leave her alone. And so <laughs> building relationships in community makes a big difference too. Yeah, absolutely. T Tara, can you jump in here for a second? And what talk talk to us about any of these ethical questions or challenges that you have faced, or how you deal with this question of, you know, you're, you're taking photo of someone doing something illegal. I mean, what <laughs> what what what, yeah, what, so what, what do you do? <laughs> I'd really love to bring Courtney and Achilles kind of points together. I love what Courtney said about recognizing the work that we do as professional photographers as a different kind of relationship to um, you know reporting and documenting than someone who is perhaps a citizen journalist or an observer or however we want to sort of frame that. I think it is incredibly important to acknowledge and recognize the responsibility and the opportunity that we have as professional photographers and professional journalists. And part of that is doing this work that Akili is speaking to is that in the moment of taking images, I'm making choices. I'm, I should be making informed choices where I'm thinking about my composition, my placement, the story, what's going on around me, that situational awareness. I'm doing all of this work as both a photographer, materially and physically present in the scene and trying to document it using you know, exterior gear, equipment, all these things, while I'm also thinking about my training and my role and my job, my work as a journalist. And so I'm putting all of that into this, this moment and doing that for me means making choices like saying, okay, this is a really powerful and important thing that's happening. A Molotov cocktail is being thrown, you know, uh, the, things are, are happening that the, the world needs to know about. And so I'm here, I should photograph it. And I can recognize that while this is an important story, it also has the possibility to potentially harm or, you know, get this person I'm photographing arrested or aggressed or whatever. And so, 
maybe I make an image of that happening where they're in silhouette. Maybe I make an image where their face just isn't in the frame. Or maybe I take all the photos that I can and when I am sitting down and I'm going through the images, I pick the photo that tells the best story while not endangering this person and, and outing them you know, for whatever they're doing. And those are all choices that we should be and are making as journalists. That's part of our job is to tell this complete story with all of this other context that we have and to be holding power accountable and also recognizing that we should be accountable to the people that we're photographing the stories that we're telling. So it is very complex and it's nuanced and it's difficult. It's getting harder and harder every day. We have all of these different things that we're talking about here. We're being you know, aggressed and, and imposed on by all these different individual actors, by tyrannical governments, people who are speaking out against us constantly, using this, you know, disinformation rhetoric to turn the public against media, news media and professional journalists. We're fighting against all of those things. And we're at the space of reckoning for our missteps in the past. And any misstep we make now is liable to be plastered all over social media tomorrow. So those are a lot of really difficult things that journalists are dealing with. But I think that also is all an incredible moment for us to rise to, to really start thinking about what does it mean to educate the public about what a journalist actually does? What does it mean to uh, be a representative for journalism when I go into the world? How can I do that work really well and ethically? How can I be really honest with people? And, um, and, and speaking of informed consent, this is something that I say all the time, that the process of informed consent is built into our work as photojournalists. Whenever I take a photo of someone, for the most part, of course, there are, there are times when this is impossible, but for the most part, the expectation is that I go and talk to them. I get their name, I get their story, I get information about them. An image is not by itself a story. I need to actually, as a journalist, you know, moving beyond being a casual a citizen observer, my job as a photojournalist is to contextualize the image that I get. And how can I contextualize an image if I don't actually talk to the person, if I have no idea what's really going on with them, why they did that, what precipitated the throwing of this cocktail, like what is happening in their mind? I need to try and get as much of that story as I can. So if I'm speaking to people to get that additional story and context to do my job as a journalist, I'm performing informed consent. They know that I photograph them, they know who I am, they know that I'm asking them these questions, they have an opportunity to say, no, thank you, I don't want to be identified, or yes, please, this is my story, thank you for doing this, this is really important. Like, that is where that happens, is in those conversations. And it's very possible and even you know necessary for us in doing our job to have those conversations. So I think that's how we really um, you know, both model and moderate these these difficult and nuanced ethical considerations and all of these things that we're working with as journalists, you know. Interesting. In you, yeah, interesting, because you were talking about the importance of context for the photos. And you reminded me of the, the famous photo from the Vietnam War of the Saigon police general during the Tet Offensive who has his gun pressed to the head of a prisoner who he executes. The photographer who took that photo later said he felt bad about it because the general was not, there was a whole story behind that and there were captured prisoners and he was trying to find out where a bomb was about to explode. And the photographer said there were two people killed that day. He killed that prisoner with his gun and I killed the general with my camera. His reputation never, uh, never because he didn't, he couldn't tell the whole context of the story. All you saw was the photograph. So very, very fascinating. You all talked about context and the importance of it. Uh, Laurel, I'll just, I just—I got a great question from the audience, but I do want to ask you about that question of context because that's one of the things that, for example, uh, the Hong Kong police said that, that things were taken out of context. Yes, you might have seen us throwing somebody to the ground, but you didn't see what that guy did beforehand, or you saw us shoot someone in the chest, but you didn't see the fact that he was hitting the policeman with a metal pole. I mean, yeah, how, how do you get context in a fast-moving situation when you're shooting quickly? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think it, you know, there are obviously limitations to a photograph at the moment in time. And I think there also was a lack of understanding in the public and even in the police and the government as to what a journalist is supposed to do and what a photojournalist is supposed to do. I think, you know, one thing we heard a lot from the police on the ground who became more and more bold and, and you know, would shout abuse at journalists was, why are you always filming us? Like, why aren't you pointing your camera the other way? Like, there you are again, just filming us and not the other side. And it's like, well, you're the police. Of course we need to 
photograph you and document what you're doing. And, and so I think there was this false idea that the police, you know, in the Hong Kong context specifically, this false idea that it was the police versus the protesters or the government versus the protesters. And that these were two equal actors engaged in this battle that were supposed to cover neutrally. But that isn't the case. You know, this is, it's the public, it's people, it's protesters versus the government, the authority, power. And so that was something that we had to navigate. And I'm not sure Hong Kong journalism ever really got across to the government or to the public um, you know, that our job is to hold power accountable. Um, and, you know, one thing that came up a lot during this conversation that I wanted to talk about in the Hong Kong context was this, you know, proliferation of, of people with cameras who aren't necessarily professional journalists. And earlier I said, you know, at the beginning, I always made sure to wear a vest and actually towards the end, I'd say like in 2020, basically, or towards the end of 2019, I actually stopped wearing a vest because there became so many, you know, so-called citizen journalists on the scene who are all dressed up as journalists and who were doing, you know, in their mind journalism, but they were people, not even with cameras, they were people with smartphones who were just live streaming. And, you know, I could look over their shoulder and they're live streaming to like 12 people. And, and yet in the way of, of professional journalists doing their job, pissing off the police, um, and also, you know, adding fuel to the fire, you know, giving credence to police claims that there are fake journalists on the scene. So that was a complication that I don't think was talked about that much. Um, and also because it happened towards the end before, you know, there stopped being protests altogether because of COVID and the national security law. Um, so that was something that was really difficult to deal with because all of a sudden I found myself having to differentiate myself from mm -hmm other so-called journalists and and it's also you know the question of who am i to to make that differentiation and i think that became a question too you know the government starting to talk about giving official press credentials and and you know where does the right lie to to accredit journalists and there started being pressure on hong kong journalist association um you know, the police started pressuring them for, for giving out too many accreditations. And I know they felt the pressure too, even though they're just like a small organization. Um, so I know we're running out of time, so I'm gonna right. stop talking there well, and yeah, answer we, questions. Yeah, we got some good questions in the chat box, which I will ask. I say Keely's daughter came up with a question. Was that was <laughs> 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 definitely allowed to ask that question if we get a little time at the end. The question was probably, when are you finished, mommy? <laughs> But uh, from KG Fukuda, our friend at the, who's the, who's the head of the uh, uh, director of the Hong Kong University School of Public Health, uh, he says, typically the stated reason for distrusting the news media is that the reporting is biased or fake, and that's the Trumpian approach to try to undermine the media. But it is also true that when in this era of social media and competing narratives, and he asked the question, is it possible to have objective or neutral reporting today? Or is that even desirable? Um, you know, who, who will feel free to just jump into that. Akila, you've got your hand up. <laughs> yeah. I think um, objective is 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 a is not a correct characterization of what we do. I think you can be fair. I think you have to be honest. Everybody comes to uh, with their own inherent biases and inherent life experiences that um, sh shapes how you see the world. So I think as trained journalists, the best we can do is to be, to truly be honest about it. And I think be, uh, to, uh, I think it's a difference between being objective and uh, you, you, sometimes you can be neutral and you really are trying to get a complete story, but I think Totally being objective is just really a false character that no one can truly carry in, in any story. And I think if you're being honest about it and being, well, <laughs> fair and balanced, <laughs> if that's possible, but it's not always 
you know, there's not always balance because sometimes the truth does shine a light on something that's truly bad on the other side. No two are equal. And our job is to inform the public of what is actually happening and, and not be afraid to take position on it from where you're shooting, uh, uh, what subjects you're photographing and how you're photographing them. Kind of, kind of hard to be neutral covering a Ku Klux Klan rally, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can I, can I add to that too? Because I feel sure. like um, both having um, started my journalism career in the Middle East and, and worked there, and then also just with the work that we do, because we are definitely protecting people who do not qualify as professional journalists and who don't have training, but are nonetheless engaged in, you know, journalism. You know, I think that uh, in many countries, being a journalist and trying to do journalism is a form of activism. You know, the citizen journalists, and I call them citizen journalists because um, in Egypt, there were, you know, very limited independent outlets for uh, journalists who wanted to write about reform or police brutality or human rights to like report in. So they did citizen journalism. You know, and that was inherently activist to cover that. And I think American journalists are coming around to the fact that um, there is no such thing as objectivity that I think, you know, I agree with what Achilles said in terms of, you know, you can try to be fair, you can try to maybe be balanced, but again, the fulcrum at which you balance will depend on your perspective. When I worked for the New York Times, my balance, you know, where I was balancing from was very different than when I worked for, for the Saudi-owned Al Arabiya news station, right? But in both cases, you're trying to, um, you know, give a, a true, accurate perspective for the audience um, on the issue that you're covering. So, I think you, what I've really noticed is that people increasingly say, "Well, journalists, you know, are biased and fake, and they should be neutral." But that's never actually been, I think, what the case was because many women, I, I certainly don't want to speak for people of color, but like, I think a lot of people did not feel that the media was ever unbiased or, you know, not, you know, not subjective because many of us didn't see ourselves reflected in the media. Um, so I think we need to like get beyond this idea, this, you know, the fake news thing is just completely blown out of proportion. And yes, there, you know, we, we are living in an era of social media. And on the one hand, that can be really confusing, especially as, you know, the deep fakes and manipulation of videos and images, et cetera, increases. But on the other hand, we see a lot more perspectives. We see a lot more types of people and you can go dive into whatever you're interested in, find information on that in a way that you couldn't before. So I think there are pros and cons. Mm -hmm. I just I want to jump on this quickly. Please, yeah, please, sir. So we live in a society that has, and I would argue, a global society that's very focused on good versus bad, hero villain. Like we're we're always um, eschewing nuance for this kind of like easy dichotomy and that's what happens with I feel with this this issue of news media being either you know biased or objective there there is actually not that dichotomy it's not simple it is every single story is nuanced and while I think we can all agree or we should hopefully all agree that genocide is bad no matter what and there are also stories that need to be told so that we can understand why is that happening? And telling those stories does not in any way um, excuse or allow genocide. It's that we need to have a very complex and nuanced understanding such that the public can make really informed and knowledge knowledgeable choices when they're voting, when they're speaking out against something or for something. And so the work that we should be doing as journalists and that many journalists do is that nuanced assessment of the stories to the best of our ability. What I think we're missing is the critical media literacy that is required of the public to recognize that work that is being done. So journalists can be being very, um, you know, honest and accurate and holistic in our storytelling. But if we're doing that work in a, in a space in which the public is just reading, is looking for the good versus the bad, then it, yes, it's, they're going to have this view of it being un, of it being biased because they wanted to just align with the view that they have and be for or against something. So we really need to 
uh, do a lot more work just in our uh, in the public and generally and uh, into you know in our social spaces in general in general to point to the importance of critical media literacy. Without that, we just we're, I think we're going to continue to see this issue where journalism is devalued and people just don't know what we're doing. They literally don't understand it and they they can't relate to it in the way that they need to, which means that we're ultimately failing and they're ultimately not receiving this really important and valuable information that every citizen needs, every person needs to be able to live our lives, you know, aware of what is happening around us. Yeah, uh, Laurel, just to bring you in there on that same question. I mean, Hong Kong now, everybody says that you got your yellow or your blue. You're either pro, pro democracy or you're pro China, pro police or pro post protester. How do you as a journalist fit into that? <laughs> yeah, I think it's, really tough. I think, you know, one thing that, that Courtney said about how in certain areas, the act of being a journalist is an act of resistance or activism in itself. And I think what's really interesting about what's happening in Hong Kong is that journalists kind of went through that transition, that regression over the course of the past couple of years where you went from working in an environment where you could be a journalist, where it wasn't a political act to where being a journalist became a political act by virtue of what the government and the regime was doing to repress journalist voices. So I think that is probably where a lot of the challenges lie, that changing role of journalism in Hong Kong and, and the changing conditions for working journalists in Hong Kong. And also going you know, back to the idea of, of, of balance on, and you know, depending on what fulcrum you're working from that Courtney mentioned, I think what is also really difficult in Hong Kong, in the Hong Kong context, in the Chinese context, and maybe in some instances the Asian context, is that, you know, in, in and I learned a lot of this from watching coverage of, of BLM in the US and, and seeing how journalists of color were grappling with working within these old institutions and, and trying to, to figure out where that fulcrum lies, right? Um, I think what's hard about the Hong Kong context is in, in the West being pro-democracy is not even really a stance, right? That is the, the bare minimum, you know, being against genocide is the bare minimum, being pro-democracy and pro-human rights is, is the status quo within which everyone is working. But here in the Hong Kong context and the Chinese context, that is a stance in itself being pro-democracy. Um, being pro human rights, being pro press freedom, making, you know, saying that genocide is bad and genocide shouldn't happen is now we're seeing also even a political statement. And that probably goes back to media literacy as well. But that is something I'm finding really challenging where, you know, being saying that I'm for democracy is, is considered very not neutral at all here um, in some circles at least. And, and that's hard and, and something I'm, I'm still struggling with and grappling with. How do I, you know, is it not neutral for, you know, do I have to disclose that I'm pro-democracy? I don't know. Yeah, Laurel, stay on, stay on the box there for a second because this earlier question from Seth Butler seems I can direct it at you because you're, you're on social media quite a lot. I saw you on Twitter. He says, thank you all uh, for all that you do to help Stuart uh, healing in, within the profession. I very much appreciate it. it. But he asked, could you comment on how the industry could more humanely manage the difficulties that mobile technology and the at times dangerous pressure of short, -term, short form storytelling has placed on reporters? Or if I put it another way, this idea that you've got to get it out instantly. You don't have time to sit around and get the context. You got it immediate. When you got that picture, you got to tweet it out. When you got that story, you got to put it out right away. How can we, how can we deal with that? Um, well, for me, you know, especially as a freelancer, I think, you know, freelance photojournalists are some of the most vulnerable in, in the journalism industry in terms of, of having to put yourself out there possibly with minimal support. Um, I think that's kind of on the industry to, to do better, to, to do better at supporting journalists, at paying journalists, having realistic expectations, not expecting them to do m many jobs. And then that goes back to the industry, you know, it, media literacy as well, people being willing to pay for journalism and, and willing to value journalism and hence, you know, provide journalism with the resources it needs to do that. And I think we've seen some 
interesting strides recently, you know, um, recently a group of organizations came together to write the photo bill of rights um, and, you know, to lay down, you know, basic, you know, rules for, for how to treat photojournalists as an industry. I mean, there's so much more they can do. Of course, this fast turnaround is, is not, you know, healthy for anyone. It's, it's difficult from a journalistic perspective. It's difficult from a um, the perspective of someone working in the field and having to get the stories out. So yes, I think the industry could do a lot more, um, but it, you know, it's all tied into the health of the industry and, and the financial state of the industry as well. So, can I just, can yeah, I just say something, um, because you mentioned about freelancers and safety, and that's something that we really focus a lot on. And I just want to mention the ACOS Alliance, which stands for a culture of safety. And one of the things we're, we're you know, one of the founding members, but it includes most of the major news agencies, photo agencies, et cetera. Um, the idea is to create a culture of safety where freelancers uh, where news organizations recognize that they have an obligation towards freelancers to make sure that they're able to do their jobs safely and that they have a moral obligation to treat them you know, with the same, uh, the same way they would their staff and that freelancers have the responsibility also to like make sure that they're prepared to go to the assignment. And I think, I think there have been a lot of strides made, but there's so much work to be done here. And so I just want to echo what Laurel said, you know, we hear from the, the journalists we work with just how at risk freelancers are and how important, you know, being paid on time is, you know, being able to pay for, you know, the, the safety gear that you need to go cover the protests, um, safely are and and just to point people you know if there are freelancers or, or other journalists who are watching this um, on our website cpj.org under resources we have a bunch of um, safety guides safety advisories we have a ppe personal protective equipment um, guide for covid we have a risk assessment template so just you know if you are watching and you're like where can i get some information as a freelancer please do um, check out cpj.org Fantastic. Thank you for that. And you know, we had a, several questions come into, the, uh, come into the panel about news literacy and the importance of it and how we can expand it. Uh, can you keep talking on that, Courtney? You, do you do, does CPJ do anything in that space of news literacy? Um, we don't do news literacy, but you know, that is part of the response, I think. You know, one reason that um, people and, and you know, law enforcement as well like, don't really understand what journalists are there to do and what journalism is about and what their rights are. Um, I think that news literacy is a really important part of the equation, but frankly, like just more general civic literacy, um, especially in the United States and elsewhere. I mean, you know, it's all tied up, but I, I would imagine there are other um, groups that are doing uh, more specific news literacy um, efforts than we are. We're just focused on protecting the journalists. I think quite a few organizations and, and schools are doing it now, trying to teach uh, young student journalists about news literacy and how not to believe everything you see. We had a question from Francis Chin. I'll just, uh, I'll just shorten it a bit. He said, every individual is biased, but he then goes on to ask the question, is there any mechanism for, to monitor biased behavior of journalists? If there is none, as the general public, how, do you, how, do they, how can the general public express their view? I guess he's saying that uh, even the journal, if the public sees that the journalism is biased, what can they do? Because the journalists are there to monitor public officials, but who monitors the monitors? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can you know, jump I'll, in there because okay. I think start with Morel and then that we'll move on to question was directed at me in part. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, the rest of the question, you know, he says there seems to be an implication that I, you know, he says, Chor even admitted that journalists have the role to monitor the police for the general public. If so, how is this fair, objective and neutral? Um, for me, you know, going back to what was said, I think this is a question of civic literacy and media literacy. Um, I think, you know, there's a, this lack of understanding in the public, for example, you know, why is police brutality a term? You know, why is police brutality different from a regular citizen being violent towards another citizen. There is a difference. And I think that goes back to civic literacy. I think there's this lack of understanding of, of what it means to hold power accountable. So my response to that question is, is you know, I'm not, I wasn't admitting anything or, or, you know, 
you know, I think, I do think that is journalism's job is to hold power accountable and police represent that power. Um, that said, like, I do agree with you, Francis, that all journalists as human beings do come into the story with their own uh, biases. And, and, and that's why we we're saying earlier that there's no such thing necessarily as pure objective journalism. You know, the, there's this, we need to forget this idea that anyone can speak from this uh, I mean, in academia, they call it the God trick, right? Like there's, we should forget the idea that anyone can speak from that perspective of absolute truth. Um, and, and in terms of how the public can, can express their views, I think there are many ways for them to express their views. Um, you know, journalists work for organizations. You can talk to those organizations. The journalists, it has been mentioned, you know, they're accountable to the public. That's because journalists are there to serve the public. So I think there are, mechanisms for, for people to, to talk about these issues. And, and the public, they're also consumers, right? You, you pay money to certain news outlets that you trust and you, you don't pay the ones you don't trust. Um, so that's one avenue as well. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I don't think these days the public has any problem in expressing their viewpoints on the uh, media. If you ever read the comment sections of any, of any news outlet, they're there. Uh, let's, I think we're going to have to wrap it up. Can we just go around, just do a quick round robin and just give me any closing thoughts you have on looking going forward here, um, you know, going forward in terms of the safety of journalists and going forward in terms of how journalists grapple with some of these difficult problems, you know, in going forward in the future. Uh, Courtney, do you have any just last one minute closing thought for our, uh, what you've learned here today from our other from our panelists or what you something you wanted to add in? Yeah, I mean, just awesome panel. I'm, I'm so excited to meet all of you. I think this has been a really smart discussion. And, you know, one one thought I had is we talk a lot about bias, but I think one of the things that journalists do is not that everyone has bias. I mean, bias is inherently a negative thing. One of the things journalists do is recognize their positionality and recognize what you might consider as biases and correct for those. I mean, that is, again, something that, that um, differentiates journalists from pundits or propagandists. So I think that, you know, as we look forward, um, this is not going to get any easier anytime soon. But as I said at the outset, I think it is more complicated than it was a year ago before the coronavirus and before the, you know, protests that have broken out worldwide, both against, um, you know, police brutality, but more broadly around, you know, political reform. I think there is this coming to grips with what journalism does in a democracy, what it does for public health and how it can help hold authorities account. But I think that um, it, it, they're just facing a very uphill battle. And um, I just want to you know, commend all of you for the work you're doing. And thank you for being out there on the front lines and supporting the journalists who are out there. Thank you. And we've uh, got a lot of resources that were posted in the chat. What we'll try to do is when we post this on our YouTube channel, or maybe underneath, we'll put up all of these resources available to journalists. Achille, you get the medal for multitasking uh, <laughs> during the Zoom. <laughs> any, uh, any last thoughts to wrap this up from your side or anything you heard that was interesting that you want to un underscore before we move on? Uh, I'm, I'm just appreciative of being part of this really amazing panel of uh, uh, visual journalists and uh, what the work that is being done out there. Um, I think we really just have to uh, still be the voice of the voiceless, you know, hold power accountable. I think we have to be transparent in our biases when they're there, but to actually, I think, strive to always tell the truth as much as you possibly can from, from the best, the point of view that, that's available to you. And to, um, you know, there's a lot of resources we have out there. I mean, like I said, the MPPA Code of Ethics, uh, is on our website, mppa.org. I've listed a lot of them here in the chat, but um, I think it's a very difficult job. And I think we have to hold each other accountable too. I think that's very important. And I think also having um, uh, news editors that will actually let you tell a fuller story 
uh, and have a voice in how a story is shaped. I think one of the biggest resentments we find in the communities we, and say marginalized communities in particular is that journalists have a tendency of parachuting in at times of crisis and then disappear and don't really give a full picture of day-to-day -day life when the cameras are gone. And I think we have to do a better job of telling those kind of stories. And I think we would have a better uh, chance of having people support what journalism means to our democracy and how important it is. Thank you for that. Dr. Tara, what, what, what interesting points did you hear out of today or anything you wanted to underscore? <laughs> Yeah, well, thank you first for having us and for all of my colleagues on this panel. It's wonderful to be here with you all and, and thinking together and talking together. Um, one of the things that I keep coming back to from our conversation today is several of us, I think, have said that the public doesn't know what journalists do. And I would argue that at this point in journalism, many of us maybe don't really know what we should be doing. We've been on the defensive for so long in response to the internet and social media, TikTok now and Snapchat. And so, you know, we're just always trying to catch up to what the public is the most engaged in that maybe we're losing ourselves a little bit. And I think this is a time, a breaking point where we need to recognize our actual power, what we can do with the work that we do when we're doing it ethically and honestly. Um, and, and I think as terrifying and terrible as this disinformation campaign has been from multiple governments and, and corporate institutions and you know certain media outlets and things like that, as frightening as that is, it is indicative that the work we're doing is powerful and important and valuable. People don't push back at you. you know, power doesn't push back at you if they think that you are not doing something that might harm them. So it shows that we actually are doing the work of holding power accountable and that we need to keep doing that. We need to keep pushing and we need to do more to make the public understand who we are, why we're doing this. And we need to constantly be critiquing and critical of ourselves. Are we doing this the way we should be? Are we rising to the occasion in an ethical way? Or are we you know, doing something that would just make sense on Twitter and is going to get the fastest response or get up on the website fastest? That's not, the best way to get to good journalism. So I really want to, I want to end on this note that this is an opportunity for us to rethink our role and to do it better and to be more vocal and insistent about how journalism matters, what journalism does and who we are as individuals and as a collective across the world trying to hold power accountable. Thank you for that. And uh, Laurel. You got up at the most inconvenient time, so you get the last word. Uh, any thoughts? <laughs> yeah, thank you. I mean, it's been such a pleasure being on this panel. I think it's really important to bring voices together from different places in the world. So thank you for doing that. And going off that last note, I, I think it is so important in this time as we, as journalists around the world, figure out what our role is, what are, what you know, especially in, in this context of, of growing populism and growing authoritarianism, we have to figure out what our job is. And I think it's also really important to have international solidarity um, as we all grapple with these issues. I, I hope to see more of that. I think it, it does make a difference, you know, in, especially in Asia, what we're seeing in, in, in Hong Kong and in Thailand and Myanmar, you know, international support for people who are really putting their lives on the line to report on what's happening. I think that's really critical. Um, so I hope there's more international discussions like this. Well, thank you all to the panelists. I also wanna thank our audience and, as well for sticking with us here. And I wanna let you know that we're gonna be uploading this entire chat onto our YouTube channel. So look for us, it's at JMSC, that's Journalism and Media Studies Center, at JMSC HKU. So please do look it up on YouTube and share it around. Um, I, I should say this, uh, we organized this panel in support of the uh, World Press Photo Exhibition that's still going on now in Hong Kong. They've got a new locale, so please everybody go to try to find it. And really a good shout out to our guest, Laurel Shore, Laurel Shore, pardon me, Emmy Award winning nominated, Emmy nominated journalist, filmmaker, photographer, Dr. Tara Pixley, photographer, professor at uh, Loyola Marymount University. Thank you for coming in. Uh, uh, Courtney Ranch, 
uh, Committee to Protect Journalists. You put a lot of great uh, resources for journalists there. We'll try to put that, connect that with the video on our YouTube site. Thank you for joining from New York. And Akili Ramses, Executive Director of National, Photogra uh, National Press Photographers Association and Champion Hair Braider. <laughs> thank you all for joining the panelists. Thank you, audience. I'm Keith Richburg. I uh, want to thank our team at JMSC for putting this together too, particularly Jennifer Wine, who was spearheaded this. And uh, we will see you all again. This is such a great topic. I think we're gonna have to come back at this again. Thank you. Thank you, thank you ladies, <laughs> for joining me. Bye-bye. Have a good day. <laughs>